Today's passage is Malachi 1, 1 through 5. Please stand for the reading of God's word. A prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, uh, despite um, the events of Ben, we did have a good time this week at District Assembly, um, the gathering together of pastors and delegates from the 73 churches of the, the Northwest District, and just always good to be together. Um, I think our kids have never been more tired. Um, they have an epic kids program um, during it, and um, uh, yesterday we got home and Seth was crying that he wanted to go back and he wanted to stay there forever. So. <laughs> well, today we're uh, beginning what will be a short series through the book of the prophet Malachi. Uh, Malachi is the final book of the New Testament, and it is a, it is a short yet, yet profound book. And the context of this book is that Israel has come back from exile in Babylon. Uh, if you know the story, Israel as a nation failed to follow God's law and live into his covenant. They had turned to the worship of idols, and after repeated warnings from the prophets, God allowed Babylon to invade them and carried them off into exile away from their home. But God, in his grace, promised them. He made a promise that this would last for 70 years, and then they would come back. And the amazing thing is, God kept that promise, and through a series of really miraculous events, God brought the people of Israel back to their own land. However, when they arrived, they found that the city of Jerusalem was in ruin, and, and so was the temple. And you can read in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah uh, some of the struggles that happened as they went about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and the temple. But the problem is, while all this was going on, and how amazing it is, the people still struggled to remain faithful to God and his covenant. And you see some of this play out in Ezra and, and Nehemiah. And, and this is the context of the book of Malachi. And the book of Malachi is a short book of God speaking to these people who have now returned to Israel. And the book is structured in a series of disputes between God and the people of Israel. And each dispute kind of plays out with either God making an accusation against the people, only to have the people disagree with God, always a smart plan, <laughs> and then God answers to show them the truth, or the people make an accusation against God and his love and faithfulness, and then God answers. And the result of this book really is that God is exposing the sinfulness and the unfaithfulness of the people, that despite all God had done for them, past and present, these people are still struggling to remain faithful, and they're questioning God at every turn. And if this sounds familiar, it's basically the history of Israel played over and over and over again, but it's also probably more likely our history played over and over again. But the great thing about this book is that God does not just accuse the people of their sin, but he also shows them a way out of their sin. And at every accusation, um, God brings hope. And the book also points to a future, a future where Jesus will come, a future where believers will be empowered by the Spirit and live as they ought, and a future where the kingdom of God will come and sin and evil will be done away with. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to look at these disputes between God and the people, and hopefully through it, examine our, our own hearts and our own practices, and ask ourselves, 
Am I being faithful? Am I actively living into the, the faith I claim? And so in our passage this morning, we see the first dispute. Uh, in verse 1, it says, A prophecy, the word of the Lord came to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? So the book begins with God really reaffirming his love for his people. He says, I've loved you, and my love has not left you, that you are still a people, you are my people, and I love you. And the answer from the people is they're very suspicious of this. And they flat out question it. You ask, how have you loved us? Now in our context, you can see this clearly um, in what I already explained. I mean, we hear them asking, how have you loved us? And I'm like, Hello, even though you sinned and were taken captive, God brought you back. He didn't leave you in Babylon where you were. He allowed you to come back to your homeland. That's amazing. But when you actually dig into it, I can also see their suspicion. Because while they have been brought back, circumstances are not easy. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down. The temple is in ruins. There's enemies actively trying to stop them. There is still poverty. There is still injustice. Circumstances are less than ideal, and life is hard for them in a number of ways. And so this is where I want to look at this text a little bit and talk about God's love and, and what we need to know, especially if we find ourselves in a time where maybe we begin to question his love, maybe due to a number of different things. And this is a good starting point with this book, that, that God starting with his love is actually really important for the rest of the book because God is basically saying, I love you, and in my love, I am going to call you out on your sin. It is not because I am angry or super wrathful on you. It is because I love you that I must correct you. And so let's talk about God's love a little bit in light of this text. And the first thing I want us to see is we can lose sight of God's love in present circumstances. It's easy for us to lose sight of God's love in present circumstances. He says, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? And what you see is because of their present circumstances, the people who have returned from exile seem to have lost their identity as God's people. And they are outright questioning whether or not God loves them or not. To, the point, to a point of this, I can see why. Because of their current uh, political and economic and religious circumstances, these people are asking, uh, why are all these things happening to us? It doesn't seem like you love us very much. And if you love us, then why? Why have all these things happened? Where is the God of justice? What do we gain by following God? Nothing has been easy. If we are indeed your people, then, then, then why? And I have to say, I think we easily do the same thing in our lives. That it's easy to lose sight of God's love and our identity in his love when our present circumstances get hard. I, heard, I read a news article about um, Chippy the Parakeet. It says, Chippy the Parakeet never saw it coming. One second he was peacefully perched in his cage, the next he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. The problems began when Chippy's owner decided to clean Chippy's cage with vacuum cleaner. She removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck it in the cage. The phone rang and she turned to pick it up. She barely said hello when, shoop, Chippy got sucked in. The bird owner gasped, put down the phone, turned off the vacuum, and opened the bag, and there was Chippy, still alive, but stunned. <laughs> Since the bird was covered with dust and, and soot, she grabbed him and raced to the bathroom, turned on the faucet, and held Chippy under the running water. <laughs> then realizing that Chippy was soaked and shivering, she did what any compassionate bird owner would do. She reached for the hair dryer and blasted her pet with hot air. <laughs> Poor Chippy never knew what hit him. A few days after the trauma, the reporter who had initially written about the event contacted the owner to see how Chippy was recovering. Well, she replied, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. <laughs> he just sits there and kind of stares. It's not easy to see why. Sucked in, washed up, blown over, that is enough to steal the, any song from a bird. But can I say, that's what seems to happen to us at times. 
it, that when times get tough and we go through things, um, sometimes it's the result of our own mistakes and sometimes it's beyond our control. But it, life throws us for a loop and inevitably it can steal our song. And when that happens, it can be hard to see beyond what's right in front of us. It can be hard to look back and see the good in our lives. And instead, we begin to question, God, are you with me? Do you love me? Are you mad at me? Have you abandoned me? This seems to be why these Jews are questioning God's affirmation of his love. God says, I have loved you. And they're like, we were in captivity but now, well, now we're back, but the walls are broken down. The temple's in ruin. We're surrounded by enemies. There's poverty. There's injustice. So how have you loved us? But while that is relatable for us at times, I also think it's very short-sighted. Because in any of these relationships, we begin to question love just on, on current things. It's not enough. There has to be more to it than just our current circumstances. I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, um, but Michaela is not a morning person. Um, and um, uh, <laughs> if I just depended on current circumstances to know I'm loved, there may be a few mornings where I will question whether she loves me or not, <laughs> at least until coffee comes into the picture. But the point is this. I know more than just what is happening in a current circumstances because our relationship has more depth than just what happens in that moment. Amen. We have a lot more history than just what happens in a morning. And it's the same with God. When we're going through trials, that does not mean God does not love us. In fact, sometimes his trials are a res result of his love, that he's trying to grow us. So we need to look deeper, which leads to God's response. And number two is, we see his love in past faithfulness. We see his love in past faithfulness. God replies, was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance for the desert jackals. Now, this needs some context, all right? Um, it's a, 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 on the surface, you're like, what is he talking about? So as the people question God's love, God's response is basically, look back and see how I've loved you and how I've been faithful to you, even when you're not deserving of it. And God points to the blessing of Jacob over Esau as an example, that way back in Genesis, Esau was the firstborn, the one that was supposed to receive the blessing and carry on the covenant that God had made with Abraham. But instead, God declares that the older will serve the younger. And Jacob's, Jacob and his descendants were chosen to be the vessel through which God would bless the world as God had promised to Abraham. Now, there's a little more to it than that. Jacob was a bit of a schemer and a sneak and cheated his brother out of the blessing and all that. And, when you, and the point is, when you look at Jacob's life, it certainly was not because Jacob was righteous that he was chosen. I mean, he was a cheat. He was a swindler and all sorts of things. It was not because he was righteous, but it was purely an act of God's grace. And the same for Israel. They showed time and time again that they were not faithful to God, yet because of God's grace, they were still the people chosen through which would eventually come Christ to bring salvation to the world. And he goes on talking about the nation of Edom, which were the descendants of Esau. And they became enemies of Israel. And God points out how many times they received judgment because of their hostility towards Israel. So essentially God is telling them, you want to see how I've loved you? Look back. I chose you even though you did not deserve it. I have protected you from enemies many, many times. He says, I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to desert jackals. And that's an interesting um, thing historically, because when Israel was invaded by Babylon, Edom actually participated in, helped the Babylonians, and delighted in the fact that Israel was invaded. Yet, God brought judgment on them from Babylon as well. 
And so that's probably what he's referring to when he speaks of a wasteland. But I think the point is really this. They ask, how have you loved us? And God says, look at your past and you will see how much I love you. How much grace I have shown you. Even though you are constantly undeserving of it, I still chose you. And it's the same with us. When we get to that point where we might cry out, God, do you actually love me? Maybe we need to look back and take stock of what God has done in our past. Do not let your present circumstances alone dictate how you view God and life. But look deeper to see the fuller picture. And when we look back and truly look at God's uh, presence and his grace throughout our lives, we may see that his love has actually always been present. That's why in Psalms 103 it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth of good things so that your youth is renewed like eagle's wings. And at the end of the day, if nothing else, we can look back and see a God who went to the cross for our salvation, who was willing to die for our sins so that we could be united with him. That is what God has already done with us. And when we look back and see that, even if our present circumstances say otherwise, we can be reassured that indeed God does love us. That in his grace, he calls us children. And for Israel, this story of God choosing Jacob and therefore choosing them as his descendants to be carriers of God's blessings to the world would have been a reminder that God does care for them. They were chosen. And then thirdly, we see his love in his promises. We see his love in his promises. And verse 5, it says, You will see it with your own eyes and say, Great is the Lord even beyond the borders of Israel. And so here God continues to talk about Edom, their, their enemies, and he says, look, your enemy is not going to prosper. In fact, if they rebuild, I'm going to frustrate their attempts to rebuild. And he ends the section with saying, you will see this with your own eyes, that great is the Lord even beyond the borders of Israel. Basically, you are going to see that I am actively working for your favor even outside the borders of your country. And it's God again showing his care for his people. He's making them a promise. You are going to see this with your own eyes. It's amazing how God cares for us in those ways. I recently read about an old man walking down the beach at dawn and he noticed a young man ahead of him uh, picking up starfish and flinging them back into the ocean. Catching up with him, he asked what he was doing. And he said, I am picking up stranded starfish that would die if I left them on the beach for the morning. But the beach goes on for miles and miles. There are millions of starfish, the man said. How can your efforts make any difference? Well, the young man picked up a starfish, looked at it and said, well, it makes a difference to this one and tossed them. <laughs> and one of the amazing things about God is his care for us individually. Care for us individually. And as his people, we can learn and trust in the promises that God has made for his people. And it's one of the ways that God shows his love for us is that he has made these promises. He's made promises to those who follow him. And if we reflect on those promises of God, I think not only will we see that he is faithful in keeping those, but it will give us hope in our present circumstances if they're hard, because we know that God will be faithful and come through in the end. And for Israel at this time, they didn't have to look very far back to see God keep his promises. When they went into exile, God promised that they would return in 70 years. And can we say that is something that doesn't happen? If you get invaded by another country and you're carried off, they usually don't let you come back. Conquered nations don't go back to their homeland. But God 
orchestrated it so it would happen. And God is faithful in keeping his promises because he does love us. And think of the promises that God has made to us as his people. Here's a few. God promises to strengthen you. In Ephesians 3, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, and according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being. God promises to give you rest. Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He promises to take care of your needs. Philippians 4, And the same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. He promises to hear and answer your prayer. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. He promises to work everything out for the good of those who love him. We know that all things work together for their for them that love God and are called according to his purposes, Romans 8. He promises to be present with you. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He promises to protect you, 2 Thessalonians 3. But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. He promises you freedom from sin, 1 John 1. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. And he promises that nothing can separate you from him. Romans 8, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation, be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he promises to you everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And when you look at these promises and see how God faithful has been, our conclusion should be a resounding, yes, God has loved us. And this is how God is answering the question from the people. How have you loved us? God says, look back, see how I've been faithful. And look at my promises, and you will see no doubt. And for us, this means we can look at the cross, look at God's forgiveness, his provision, and look what he's promised us and say, even if I'm going through trials now, the big picture tells me God's love is for me. And I hope you know that in your soul today. And so don't let what is currently happening, whatever that is in your life, distort your image of God and his love. But may you look at these things and say, I am loved by God. And this is where the book of Malachi begins, and it's a good place for it to begin. Because over the next several weeks, as we unpack this more, and we see this back and forth between God and the people, the book of Malachi deals with some hard subjects. Subjects like judgment and justice and sexual immorality, and even money. And there are times in this book where God's people cry out, and it sometimes seems like God's answer is almost to skip over to our plea and say, yeah, but I'm going to do this in the future. And so over the next few weeks, this is not an easy text for us to tackle. But my hope is today, and throughout this series, that it maybe will shed some light on what some of us may be feeling as we practice our faith. And that it would help us to bring our lives into complete alignment with God so that we can live out our faith with joy and peace and live out this faith in authentic ways that makes a difference. And the truth is, while our culture may be different and technology is certainly different, The themes of this book are extremely relevant to us today. So may this help us examine our faith, and may God speak to us through this over the next few weeks. Let's pray. Father, as we begin to look through this this book, a book that has some hard themes, God, thank you that 
today, we can look back to your faithfulness, we can look to your promises, and we can say, no matter what, God loves us. And Father, I pray that we would just be sure of that today. God, if there's anyone in this room who's just going through it right now, who maybe is questioning some things, God, may your love shine through to them. May they walk out today without a doubt in their soul, if nothing else, that they have a God who loves them, who cares for them, who is with them. And I pray, Father, we would carry that with us this week as we once again go into a dark world. May the light of your love in us shine forth. And may it cause ripple effects all over this community that lead to the salvation of souls. Go before us today, Lord, and we pray all this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said. Well, go in his love today. You are dismissed.